Thank you. Welcome, Professor Arun Bhadrup Sage. He is from ISS Kolkata. Uh, we met for the first time very, very long ago on the, in Chennai on the day that India passed away. And uh, our collection sort of continues from there with some blends and so on. So Arundo was uh, visiting uh, GCHC for quite some time, I think mm. uh, a few months. A few months, uh, yeah. In this summer. And we thought it would be a great opportunity to have him come here and tell us something about, uh, teach us something about his favorite topic. Uh, he had chosen the topic of uh, singular classical mechanics, uh, which is uh, everybody at some point of time learns classical mechanics. Once they come to the singular part, they say, okay, okay, mm. we just give up on it in singular part. So we hope that we hmm. get some insights on this uh, by listening to him. So Ananda, please. Uh, okay, thanks. So let me thank you once again for the introduction. And now, okay, as I said, Today's topic will be stuff that everybody here knows. So why are we doing this? Two reasons. One is to get everybody on the same page. The other is to establish notation so that when I say something next day, it's going to sort of make sense. Now, when I say everyone knows, I'm assuming, of course, that everybody has here has done a course in classical mechanics, at least a standard first course. And all of you know, I'm sure, that there's something called the action, which for point particle mechanics is basically this. And we call this a functional of a, sorry, functional of Q of t. So if you know the path Q of t from that, you can calculate what the action is going to be, right? And L in general is a function of q, q dot, also time. Sometimes I will remember to put the time in, sometimes I will forget about it. Because frankly, the time dependence of the Lagrangian is not really of going to be of central importance to us. So many of our Lagrangians may be time dependent, some may not be. But they will definitely depend on q and q dot. Now, at this stage, one question could immediately arise, which is, what about higher derivatives? Why, why do we have only q and q dot and not, not higher derivatives? Again, this is standard classical mechanics, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But basically, the answer would be that if you had higher derivatives, which you can, by the way, then typically the system becomes unstable. The time evolution becomes unstable. There's a theorem called Ostrogratsky theorem, which tells you that. We are not going to discuss too much about this because that's really not our main topic today. Now, we all know that this is what we call the action principle. That is, if you vary the path, that is, q changes to q plus delta q. And of course, q at time t changes to q at time t plus delta q t with the restriction that delta q at the two endpoints of your motion, or to whatever two endpoints you've decided, is zero. So you consider paths which go from a particular set of queues. So this is a point in configuration space which stands for multiple queues, q1, q2, whatever many queues you have. So this is your initial thing, the final thing. And okay, now I don't have color chalks any longer here, so. You consider a varied path from the classical one, a path where at time t, so this of course is along t and this is q. At time t, the classical path was q of t. You're moving delta q of t away from that. And this is your, the dashed line is the path you're going to take. And the idea is that the classical path is given by that which extremizes the action. So the first order variation in action vanishes. And so this is a calculation which almost everybody, I'm sure, has done. It's going to be dt plus del L, del q dot i, delta q dot i. Uh, even if L had been time dependent, 
in this variation, there is no time dependence because basically you are taking the change in the Lagrangian function at a given time t when you change q to q plus delta q. Of course, because you are changing q to q plus delta q, that's your variation. Your q dot at the same time changes to q dot t plus d d t of delta q of t. In other words, the change is basically in the path itself. Change in q dot comes along with it, which is why we consider this to be a functional of q of t. The moment you know q of t, q dot t is automatically given. The Lagrangian is a function of q and q dot. That is, you know the value of q, you know the value of q dot, that gives you the value of Lagrangian at that instant of time. But when you're talking of the path, you have given q of t. So q of t being given means q dot t is automatically given along with it. So the functional is a functional of q of t alone. q dot t is not an independent argument there. Now here, the next step that we carry out is again something which is very familiar to all of you. What you do is uh, write this delta A leave the first term as it is and uh, I'm sure I don't really have to explain the convention here right this is the summation convention where which you use all the time and this thing is actually d d t of delta q i so what you do is write the whole thing as a derivative, of course, at the expense of taking away this term. So the variation in the action whenever you change the path ultimately becomes this. I'm deliberately putting a minus sign here. It doesn't really matter much except for the definition part. The second term comes from the total time derivative term here. You can, of course, integrate that out, and you get this term, which is del del qi dot delta qi at t2 minus that same thing at t1 and if we only consider variations which vanish at the two endpoints this extra term will definitely vanish this ei stands for whatever is in front of delta qi in the rest of the thing so ei basically is ddt of del l del qi dot minus del l del qi and the reason why I'm calling this EI should also be obvious to everybody. This is basically what vanishes and gives you the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion. The E, of course, stands for Euler. Okay. Now, this is going to play a very, very important role in all of what we are going to talk about, these EIs. So, if we are talking of paths which do not change at the two endpoints, this term, of course, goes away. And now, for the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion, what you get is this thing has to vanish. And if you are assuming that the delta qi's are all independent, that is, you can vary the coordinates independently, then what happens is that you must insist that each and every one of the ei's must vanish. Right? So ei equal to 0, ddt of del l del qi dot minus del l del qi equals 0. That's the standard equation. OK. Now, Let's try to look at the structure of the EI in a bit more detail. I think that cloth would clean better. Oh, well, yeah, that's something. So how far does it go? It comes back on the other side? But at least there's one more board I can get, right? Oh, okay, good. It did stop it. It went, went way too far yeah, away. You can bring it back yeah, by pressing the other one. Yeah. I, I just hope it stops. <laughs> ah, I did press it right. Okay, so these EIs are going to play a huge role 
at least for the next two lectures. So let's take a look at this structure a bit more carefully. Now L, remember, is a function of Q, Q dot, and perhaps also T. So this thing, so del L del Q i dot, of course, is also a function of Q, Q dot, and T. So if you do a time derivative of that, what you really get is the following. Right? That's one term. Another term that you get is, I hope the dots are visible because this one has a dot, this one doesn't. And times dqj dt plus a third term. All of these are actually coming from this ddt of del l del q i dot. And then, of course, you have minus del l del q i. This is, this is the full form for EI, okay? And this is often something we write in this form, at least when we want to focus on the singular nature of Lagrangians, especially if they are singular, we would like to write this as this. Wij, which is a function of Q and Q dot, times Qj double dot, plus K, which also is a function of Q and Q dot. So the term which has the accelerations in them, we have, we have separated them out. Everything else depends only on QQ dot, right? Now, when we are talking of the equations of motion, what we do, yeah, this one, the green one moves them up. No, other way around. Oh, this one stops immediately, Achha. And now, I have to get rid of the contraction. <laughs> now, when you get the equations of motion out of this, that is, when you set E i's to 0, what you are trying to do actually is solve for the accelerations, right? So accelerations will give you second order differential equations, and then so you would solve them on the basis of initial conditions. So the equations are basically this. And now the important question is, can I write these equations in such a way that I can solve for the accelerations? So when can I solve these equations for the accelerations? This is what we actually do, right? When we write down this set of equations, we assume that this will give you the second order differential equations of motion. So q1 double dot, q2 double dot, up to qn double dot, all of them we will get out of this. Do we get, out, get them out of this? Can I always solve a set of equations like this? The wij is a matrix which depends on q and q dot, but it's a matrix. It's a set of bunch of linear equations for the q double dots. Can I solve them? The answer is, if the wij form a matrix which is invertible, right? So, there's a matrix formed by the second derivatives. which has a fancy name, it's called the Hessian matrix for this particular Lagrangian. If this is an invertible matrix, then you can solve all of these equations for, second, for the accelerations. And this will give you the standard second order differential equations. And after that, you know the story, right? If you have the initial conditions given, let's say the two n initial conditions, initial position and initial velocity, then in principle, you should be able to solve these equations. And typically, you have solutions which at least exist between T1 to T2. The only problem here is this Wij. Is it guaranteed to be invertible? Well, in almost all systems that we talk about, it is invertible. And such systems are called non-singular systems. Or usually, don't even call them any name because they are the usual ones to deal with. 
However, it might very well turn out that Wij is not invertible. That is, determinant of this Wij vanishes. Now, if that happens, then all kinds of new stuff occurs. Things which you usually don't see in a standard classical mechanics course simply because those are the things we avoid, as Amol said. Uh, one question could be why would we bother even talking about those things? After all, if they don't occur in usual cases, why should we bother? The answer is it actually occurs in many, many places. Especially any kind of theory with a gauge symmetry in it, which means almost all interesting theories that we have actually has this kind of singularity inbuilt. We'll soon see why. Okay, at least not soon, maybe tomorrow. But, uh, well, the other major reason is when you want to quantize a theory, the most obvious theory way you have is so-called canonical quantization. You start with the Hamiltonian structure. There you have these nice equations, Q1 dot equal to del H, del QI dot equal to del H del PI, and PI dot is minus del H del QI. Or you can make it even look even more fancy. Have you already covered the Poggio brackets with them? OK, anyway, you can make them look a bit more fancy by introducing something called a Poggio bracket, which you are going to talk about. And uh, these Poggio brackets have this nice behavior that they have some algebraic structure which is exactly like commutators. Like they obey something called a Jacobi identity and stuff like that. And in fact, the way you do canonical quantization is write down the classical theory, put everything in terms of nice Poggio brackets, and then replace the Poggio brackets by commutator brackets, which is something which I'm pretty sure all of you have done sometimes or the other, right? This Q comma P Poggio bracket is one, and that becomes in quantum mechanics, this Q comma P commutator is IH cross. The trouble is, very often you will find that the singular systems, in fact, not very often, always, if you have a singular system, the problem is not just in finding out Q double dots from the equations of motion, the problem also is in forming a proper Hamiltonian, okay? And writing down the corresponding Poggio brackets. In fact, if you insist, so for example, let's take one example which we are not going to really discuss in this class because we are not doing field theory, we are going to do particle dynamics. But let's say electromagnetism, Maxwell theory, has a gauge symmetry which all of you know about, right? By the way, is it gauge or gauge in this class? Gauge, okay, that's, it's best to be clear of that because uh, I, God is maybe right, but it sounds very bad in my, to my ears. Okay, uh, the U1 gauge theory, which electromagnetism has, has an immediate consequence that it has one momentum which vanishes identically, pi zero is zero. So the moment you try to quantize the theory like that with pi i comma phi j is delta i j, you land up in trouble because a zero cannot have a non-zero commutator bracket. So this whole business of passing on to a quantum theory by changing the Poggio brackets directly into commutator brackets, they don't work unless the structure, unless the Lagrangian happens to be non-singular and the passage to Hamiltonian is fine. The whole issue is for many very interesting theories, it simply doesn't work out that way. So you have to live with a way of working around this. So how do you do quantical quantization with singular theories? That's a real question. And that is the reason beha behind Dirac actually spending a lot of time and, di the and producing the theory of classical dynamics of such constraint systems first. Once you have the classical dynamics right, doing quantization becomes sort of much simpler, if not obvious. I shouldn't say obvious, but it becomes much simpler. But Let's at least talk about the, again, stuff that you all know. That was the heading for today's class. So let's talk about this passage to the Hamiltonian. So DL, the d given the Lagrangian, is of course given by del L del QI, dQI, plus del L del QI dot, dQI dot plus del L del T, dT, and then what we do is write this term as D of 
leave these terms as they are. Sorry, d of q i dot. So, all I am doing is I am writing this, this thing into d of q i dot as d of this whole thing minus of course, uh, times q i dot plus del del, del t dt. And the next step that we do is we simply take everything to one side and write this as d of del l del q i dot q i dot minus l that is the l that was sitting on this side we have just moved it to the other side is minus del l del q i d q i minus and this one moves to the other side so plus q i dot d of del l del q i dot minus del l del t dt. By the way this quantity that I have written down here del l del q i dot q i dot minus l this has a name anybody can tell me who, what this is? What is this called? Hamilton. Hamilton. There's a Jacobi function, small h. It's a function of q, q dot, and possibly t. And the reason why it's interesting is that as long as L does not have an explicit time dependence, you can show that this is a conserved quantity. And in our standard situation where the Lagrangian is something you can write down as kinetic minus potential, where the kinetic is quadratic, this actually becomes kinetic plus potential. Okay, but this is not yet the Hamiltonian because in order to be the Hamiltonian you would want to write it in terms of q, p and t. So the important issue is this del l del q i dot which are the canonically conjugate momenta, the ith canonical mo momentum. What you want to do is write, rewrite this function by changing all the q dots and bringing in p's, right? Now the important question is, what do you have here are pi's given as functions of q, q dot and t, right? Lagrangian was a function of q, q dot t, you differentiate that with respect to qi dot, you get a function of q, q dot and t. The important question is, can I solve these equations to get the q dot in terms of p's? Once we do that, if I can solve this and get q dot i is some function of q and p, possibly also t, okay? If we can get this, then the passage to Hamiltonian is clear. You don't have to do anything else. You just replace all the q dot i's wherever they come with the fi's and you get a new expression which is what you call the Hamiltonian. But the important question is, this is a bunch of equations which you have, which you want to solve for q dots. Is it guaranteed that we can always solve them for q dots? No. Well, depends on the functions, of course. And the guarantee is really not there in general. What you have is this. And this is something which comes from a piece of mathematics called the, in, called the inverse function theorem. Uh, I'm not really going, into go, going to go into the details of that, but the basic idea is simply this. You calculate this quantity, which of course is the ideal element of a matrix. Find out its determinant, or find out whether this is invertible. If this is invertible, the inverse function theorem of mathematics guarantees that at least locally you should be all able to solve the q dots for the p's. Okay. If this is not invertible, then the p's are actually not functionally independent and you will not be able to get n q dots from the n p's. So, these are 
pi equal to pi q q dot t that is of course a coupled set of equations, right? Here, if you are writing p1, p1 does not necessarily have only q1 dot. It may have q1 dot, q2 dot, etc. q and t of course will be there, but that's not what we are really focused on right now. But this pi equal to del L del qi dot, this gives us a bunch of n equations. Simultaneous equations to be solved for the q dots. The condition that allows us to solve these equations is the following. If this Jacobian of the transformation from q dot to p, if this Jacobian is invertible, then the inverse function theorem guarantees that you can solve this at least locally and get the q dots. Okay? We will see plenty of actual examples where you can and where you can't later on. This actually works out to be the exactly the same as the WIJ that we talked about. So the same quantity WIJ which allows you to solve, which allows you to check whether you can solve for the accelerations, essentially is the same thing that ensures whether you can solve for the P's, for the Q dots in terms of the P's. So if WIJ, this matrix formed by WIJs, this is singular. The Lagrangian formulation itself has a problem that you don't get enough independent equations for the second order differential equations. The Q dots can't be solved for the for. And also the same problem persists when you try to go into the Hamiltonian. Okay? Fine. So okay, one thing which I can't resist talking about, although it's really not part of the uh, actual topic here is this. We often do things like this. We say L is a function of q, q dot and t. H, small h, you talk about it at all. The Jacobi function is a function of q, q dot and t. P i q i dot minus L. And Hamiltonian, we say is a function of q, p and t. Okay. Now this is an aside. This is not really part of the rest of the talks about singular systems. But this is an interesting enough thing, and I'm pretty sure many of you already know this, but some of you may not. So let me just point out one issue. This is very similar to what you have in thermodynamics. In thermodynamics, you have internal energy, which is a function of what? Temperature volume, right? Or? Well, if it's a simple hydrostatic system, the common thing to say is u is a function of S, V, and N, which seems to be completely nonsense because the most common expression that you know for u, at least for a monoatomic ideal gas, is simply this. And that, of course, has neither V nor, oh, does have, it does have N, but definitely doesn't have S in it, right? Now, the important question is this equation is a valid equation. Nobody is disputing this. But this has a special role to play. Can anybody tell me why this is special? Or you do something very often, right? You say, I don't know whether this third term is familiar to all of you. But usually, if we talk about closed systems and closed systems only, where n is fixed, the third term doesn't come in. So it doesn't show up in many textbooks. But this is the full expression, TDS minus PDB plus mu dn. And then you do something like this. You say u minus PV, or plus PV, sorry, has this nice property that if you take the D of that, and very often what we say is because DU has a DS, a DV, and a DN, Therefore, u is a function of S, V, and N. And because this quantity, which of course is called the enthalpy, D capital H, has dS, dP, and dN, therefore it should be a function of S, P, and N. Now that really is not very meaningful, right? After all, I can write S as a function of P, V, N as well, or eliminate the S, bring in something else. In fact, this form has only T in it. The important question is when I say u, 
in thermodynamics is a function of S V and N. What do I really mean by that? This one, of course, is not. But there is one very important issue about this. If I told you that U is 3 by 2 nRT, what information can you give out of that? You can give me the heat capacity, right? 3 by 2 nR is the heat capacity. Can you, from this, tell me what the pressure equation is like? If I just give you this, from this, can you find out pressure? That is PV equal to nRT. Is that somehow encoded in this? Yes or no? So I want an opinion. How many of you are saying yes? If you know that this is an equation which an ideal gas obeys, that's a different question. I have told you that I have a system which has U is 3 by 2 nRT. Does that tell me that PV is nRT? On the other hand, suppose I somehow gave you U as a function of S, V, and N. Then, notice that T is simply del U del S at constant V and N. Right? You can calculate temperature directly from there. This temperature will come out as a function of S, V, and N. But you can eliminate, so you have U, which is a function of S, V, N. Now you have T, which is a function of S, V, N. You should be able to eliminate the S between these two and write U as a function of T, V, N. Pressure, differentiate with respect to volume partially, this expression is going to give you pressure. Again, as a function of S, V, N, but you can eliminate variables, whichever ones you want to get rid of. Mu, if you wanted that, del U del N, right? And you want mu as a function of temperature pressure, you can just get rid of some of the variables, eliminate them, you will get that. What is important is that this has complete thermodynamic information about the system. Everything you want to know about the thermodynamics of a system which is described by just one component is given by this function. Where does this function come from? Not from thermodynamics. Thermodynamics cannot tell you what this function is going to be. Because if it did, thermodynamics is universal. If it really said what this function has to be, then every system would have behaved the same way. That, of course, is not the way the world is. You can either get this from experiments, or you can get this from some more fundamental theory, like statistical mechanics, let's say. But this has complete thermodynamic information. Now, the important thing is, if you give me H as a function of S, V, and N, which is what you would usually get, right? You started with U, even if you started with U as a function of S, V, and N, you calculate pressure from there by taking a derivative. You add P times V, you're going to get a function of S, V, and N. But that is not going to have complete information. What is going to have complete information is H given as a function of S, P, and N. Are you all familiar with this? Why does this happen? That is, why is it that giving you H as a function of S, V, and N sort of makes you lose information? So for that, let me see. And the reason why I'm talking about thermodynamics here is basically because the passage from L to H is exactly the same thing. What you do when you go from L to H is exactly what you do when you go from U to capital H, the enthalpy, or U to the free energy, or to the Gibbs free energy. All of them, basically, the same maths is behind the whole thing. And the idea is really very simple. Suppose I had a function which I loved, say y is x squared, so a nice function. And let's say x is only positive, so I don't really have to worry about multiple validness and stuff like that. This is a nice invertible function. For positive x, you know, if you know y, you know x, uh, you know x, you know y. Now, suppose somebody else doesn't like x for some reason and prefers p, where p is dy dx, the derivative. Now, if I know y equal to x square, can I use that information to write y as a function of p? Of course I can, because this gives me p equals 2x. So x is p by 2. Put that back and get y equal to p squared by 4. 
So my friend who hates x, likes p, can give me this function. The question is, if somebody give, tells me y is p squared by 4, and I don't know what p is, p is dy dx, can I use that information to get y equal to x squared back? Why not? You're right, but what I if you know y equal to p squared by 4, what you really know geometrically, the slope of the tangent, and y is what? y is the height of tangency, right? So what you know is a tangent which makes a 45 degree angle is tangent at this height. But you do not know the tangent, right? Because this would do the trick, so would this, so would this, so would this. Same height of tangency, different x's, right? So the moment you give me y equal to p square by 4, geometrically you have actually given me a bunch of tangents, but you have not really given me the tangents, because this is a possibility, which of course would reconstruct the or actual original equation, but this is also a possibility. Just shift the whole thing by x, by some a, because the information I have is the height at which you have a tangent and what the slope of the tangents is. But tangent is a straight line, and a straight line, to be specified, how many numbers you need? Two, Two but height of tangency and slope is not one of them. Right? So if you want only two, you can either give me a point on the straight line, which requires two numbers, and the slope, that of course will require three numbers. But as you all know, there's a more economical way of specifying that. Which is the more economical way? Slope and intercept. So instead of giving me height, y as a function of the slope, if somebody gave me this intercept as a function of the slope, then using that I can reconstruct all the tangents. And hopefully, unless there is a singularity which comes in because you may have multiple tangents with the same slope, unless that happens, I should be able to reconstruct this function for you. Now what is this thing? This is, this is y. This is x, right, for that point. And this p is the slope of this straight line. So what is the coordinate of this point? It's y minus how much you come down when you have decreased x by, decreased by x. That's px. So y minus px, if you give this quantity, y minus px, as some function g of p, that is complete information. From that, you can reconstruct the original graph back. The moment you give me y as a function of p, you're losing information. You cannot reconstruct the entire graph back. There are infinitely many possibilities. But if you give me the intercept as a function of the slope, that means you have essentially given me all the tangents. And unless the curve is shaped like this, for example, so uh, two different points giving you the same slope, which of course will be a problem. Unless you have such a situation, you should be able to reconstruct the graph entirely. So in order to do this without losing information, you don't like x, the original variable, you like the derivative corresponding to it, p dy dx. What should you do? You cannot give me the original function. What you have to give me is the original function minus the variable you want to get rid of, x, times the variable you want to bring in, p. So let's look at what we do when we want to get rid of volume here. We want to get rid of volume. What you can bring in is the derivative, which is minus p, actually, or pressure. right? And what do you have to do for that? You subtract from u, the function, the derivative, which is minus p, times what you want to get rid of. That's the y minus px thing. So you have to subtract from u minus pv. If you give me u minus minus pv, u plus pv, as a function of s, p, and n, you are giving me as much information as the original u as a function of s, v, n had. You are not losing any information. You can go back and forth. Okay. You give me h as a function of temperature or anything else, you are actually giving me less information. Okay. Similarly, you want to get rid of s, you can, but you can't get rid of s in favor of anything else. You have to get rid of s and bring in t. 
And to do that, what you have to do is subtract from you t times s, which is something you all know. But the reason why this works is a simple geometrical fact that what you're really giving is the intercept as a function of the slope so that you can reconstruct the entire thing back. Okay. Once again, this works only when there are no singularities of this kind that we talked about. Should be able to figure out why. If Wij, this determinant that you had, the Hessian, when you went from L to H, had a singular behavior, that would essentially mean that you would have multiple tangents which have parallel slopes. So you will not be able to reconstruct the thing back. So this is, of course, an aside. It's really not essential for understanding singular things. but. Uh, this is actually important enough in itself. And I'm pretty sure all of you know the name of this transformation. What is this called? Yeah. Okay. I was asking people because I always get confused. I sort of confuse this with Lagrange all the time. So, and I have to keep on remembering, you know, Lagrange is the fellow who wrote the Lagrangian down, so this is somebody else. Uh, but okay. okay, do we call the column Legenda here or Lahodr? We call, call this legenda, right? Yeah, okay, let's be, behave like nice people and not try to pretend to be French. Okay, so today we, what we talked about was where the basic stuff, right? All things that everybody knew everything that we talked about today, right? Except perhaps the WIJs not being invertible can cause a problem. So let me just give you an example of a situation where things could go wrong. Suppose I have this Lagrangian, which we are going to use for several examples later. Okay. Now, just uh, I will just write down the px today. I suppose I want to go to the Hamiltonian. The first problem will be px will be fine. Px will be x dot. This is x dot. X dot plus y. Not a problem, I have got a momentum which is not really mass times velocity, it has an extra piece, but that's really not that, un un that unusual. <coughs> How much is Py? Zero. Zero. So that brings us to a possible problem. And the problem here, of course, is I can solve, if I want to solve this for velocities, it's obvious that I can solve for x dot, but I can't solve for y dot, right? There is no y dot anywhere in this equation, so I can't find y dot as a function of x and p. But let's just force ourselves forward. Let's try writing down the Hamiltonian. Let's call this hc, the canonical Hamiltonian, which will be, by definition, of course, this is the Jacobi function. In order to get the Hamiltonian out of that, I will have to get rid of all the x dot and y dot. This seems to be a bit of a problem because, uh, well, I can't solve this for y dot, obviously. But let's see what happens. Px x dot, that's, in fact, if I do this, I should be able to tell you what will come out without actually having to do the calculation. <coughs> now, did you teach them that? that uh, the homogeneous quadratic homogeneous linear thing? No. Okay. Okay, but so. There should be something which you should be. Anyway, you can do the calculation directly anyway. Not a big deal. Right? You can just do the calculation. This is what you're going to get. This is still not the Hamiltonian, of course, because it has x dot in it. But note that the one variable which would have caused us problems, the y dot, which I can't solve for in terms of px, py from this equation, is also not in this expression. Right? So I should be able to write this down. In fact, this is x dot is px minus y, so this is px minus y whole square minus half of x minus y whole square. So it looks like things are going nice, right? Because I can write down the canonical Hamiltonian. The problem that I highlighted, that you will not be able to solve for all the velocities, that's actually not showing up. The problem will come up next if you try to calculate the canonical equations of motion from this, which You've all done, right? From a Hamiltonian, you can calculate the equations. Try it, you will find that you will not get the same equations that the Lagrangian would have given you. Okay, so there's something wrong. If you believe that the Lagrangian equations of motion are where you're starting from, then 
writing this as a canonical Hamiltonian, which at least doesn't have a problem that you are have to worry about the y dot. But you write down the equations with this, you will find that the equations will come out wrong. That is because, well, because of the singularity again. So next two lectures, we will talk about the Lagrangian formulation. Try to sort of see, given a singular Lagrangian, can we identify gauge symmetries directly from there? Gauge symmetries would simply be, can I change the coordinates in a time-dependent manner? Uh, I'm pretty sure many of you know what local gauge symmetries are, right? Usually, when you're talking about field theoretical scenario, you would say that a change is done, which can depend on space and time. Here, we are only talking about point particle dynamics, so only time. But if you can you change the, the, the coordinates by time-dependent amounts and still get the system to give you the same, obey the same equations of motion? It will turn out to be a property of singular Lagrangians that that will always be the case. You should always be able to find out new, uh, a changed versions of the coordinates where you can do a gauge transformation, a time dependent transformation, and you will end up with still the same equations to be with. So we will talk about uh, the Lagrangian formulation in some detail in the next lecture and the lecture after that. The five, fourth lecture, we will talk about this thing, how to go to a Hamiltonian and how to actually get the equations back. You do it directly, it will not work. You have to do some fancy jugglery before that. Okay. And if we have enough time, which I'm not so sure, I might even have enough time in the fifth lecture to talk about the Dirac theory of Dirac brackets as opposed to Poisson brackets, but I don't think I'm, I might just sort of indicate how that goes. I may not be able to discuss that in some detail. But the basic idea is to make you aware that there is a huge class of very important systems where the standard methods that you learn in mechanics actually fails for good, with, for good reason, and there are ways of going around that. Okay, so I think I'm done today, right? <laughs> uh, applause is unim unimportant, what's important is questions. Yeah. Does this only happen, and maybe I Which one? does this only happen when the T, T's and mu's are not independent because there's Gibbs theorem? Yeah. Because in this case, no. we know that there is a constraint True. in between yeah, but, uh, but even without that, those constraints, the mathematical structure of going from u to h would be perfectly all right. If that constraint were not there, this works. That constraint, even, even without that, even with that constraint, there's no problem, that constraint doesn't cause a problem here. That constraint that you're talking about simply comes from a special fact that all these SCNs are extensive variables. So again, Euler's theorem ends up telling you that u is actually Ts minus pv plus mu n, but that's really not important. What W that constraint actually comes in in the way that if you try to get rid of all of the three, that is, okay, say, say I want to get rid of S, I can bring in T, I can get rid of V, I can bring in P, I can get rid of N, I can bring in Mu. Problem will be that this U and whatever derivatives you get, or not derivatives, but whatever you get out of them, these are all extensive variables. If you manage to get rid of S, V, N, N completely out of that, you will get an extensive variable, which is a function of intensive variables only, which is, of course, absolutely impossible. And what happens is because of that constraint that you talked about, if you try to get rid of S, V, and N, all three, and bring in T, P, and Mu, you will end up with identical zero. That is, then you will lose complete information. Yeah. No, my question was that, does that constraint no, that constraint does in eliminating one alone? No, no, that constraint doesn't play a role here. That, that is a very special situation because you have extensive variables here and U is an extensive variable. But for example, in Lagrangian dynamics, that, that has no role to play. There is no such constraint there. So that's an independent thing. That has nothing to do with this. This can be done as long as your Hamilton, here the internal energy is a well-defined, nice, smooth function. Of course, the problem would be that if you had a kind of singular Lagrangian, then going from Lagrangian to Hamiltonian will have this problem, that you will not be able to get rid of all the velocities. And we will see in some examples that exactly what kind of problems come about. Yeah. So uh, when you go for singular Lagrangian, this, uh, what happens to the Noether theorem? 
In fact, uh, something very nice happens with the knowledge theorems. We are going to perhaps talk about them because uh, basically gauge symmetries give you another, another like symmetry, like conservation quantity automatically. Yes, uh, in fact, uh, singular Lagrangians are more common than you might think because they are sort of everywhere. Okay, any other questions? Well, that depends on if you are talking on the conservative system, right? And moreover, this picture that L is T minus V is valid only if you want to reconstruct and get back exactly the class Newtonian equations of motion. In dynamics, the Lagrangian basically decides your dynamics. So whatever function you give, L equals some Q, Q dot T, function of Q, Q dot T, that decides what your equation is what your equation of motion is going to be. Like say, Newton's laws tell you that force equal to mass into acceleration, all that is fine. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't tell you what the force is going to be, right? Because mm -hmm. if that happened, then life would have been very dull. After all, you have variety in the world simply because different systems have different kinds of force systems. Similarly, Lagrangian describes what your system is. Once you have the Lagrangian, the equation of motion follows from that. So the kind of thing you're talking about happens in a very specific situation. But the Lagrangian is given by t minus v, it's also in explicitly independent of time. So you end up with this uh, Jacobi function, which is t plus v in that case, works out to be independent of time. So like can there have a like similar motion in this case? Not necessarily, it depends on whether the energy is conserved at all. You may not be able to identify a kinetic energy and a potential energy always. Okay, let me just, uh, just say one thing. I just now said something which is actually wrong. I said, give me any function of q, q dot and t that will be a valid Lagrangian. But that's really, really not right. Suppose I give you L equal to q. Then del L del q dot will be zero, right? DGG of that will be zero. And del L del q will be one. So you took that and write, tried writing down the Euler-Lagrange equation of motion, you'll get zero equal to one, an obvious contradiction. So. It's not really true that any L will do. You have to have, we are only going to talk about those Ls which do not give you self-contradictory information. Okay. Now, the other thing, I'm not sure whether you have covered this. Do you know whether, can you always write down your equations of motion using a Lagrangian? No. So, are there, do you know when you can and when you can't? Or there's a criterion which you can use? You've heard of Helmholtz? Criteria, right? So at least there are ways of deciding that if you write written down a set bunch of equations, can you actually write a Lagrangian from which they will follow? Okay, but Lagrangian has to be kinetic minus potential. It's a sort of restricted thing. It doesn't always have to be. And, uh, the, the, is there a problem with uh, like if, I, if I have uh, x dot term, hmm. means the velocity changes in a way uh, negative sign, right? Like it depends on the displacement of velocity. Also. No, I think again, uh, I'm not sure whether I understand you right, but that might be a situation where you get x dot square. Okay, you mean having an x dot term is a problem. That actually is not a problem because sometimes, especially in an accelerated frame, you will get x dot like terms all the time. Even in standard systems, just take a particle on a spring that will have half mx dot square plus, uh, plus half kx, minus half kx square zero Lagrangian. But now see this same thing from the point of view of an accelerator observer. You are going to get an exot term. Or have a, sp have a spring where the length changes or has, a, has some time dependence, a string constant has time dependence. Mm -hmm. All kinds of situations are there where you will get a linear term. Mm -hmm. Having a linear term in itself is not a problem. Here the problem is not that you had an x dot. By the way, a very common case where the Lagrangian has a velocity in it. All of you know this, right? The electromagnetic theory. So you took a, take a particle in an electromagnetic force field. You will have a velocity dependent term, which will have a Vx term apart from a Vx square, right? So that happens all the time. It's not here. The problem really comes in from a very important point of view, which is if you calculated the W here. The, here the W is very simple. It's one zero zero zero, an obviously non-invertible matrix. 
that's where the real problem comes from. Well, basically what we wanted to do was you want to retain the y equal to x square information, but you don't want to use x. You want to use a different variable. Maybe because that variable is something you can better control. Like say chemists like enthalpy very much, much more than phases do because chemical reactions take place in the open most of the time. So constant pressure is much easier to maintain and control. So they want the derivative. Now you want instead of x, you want the derivative as your independent variable. But if you kept the dependent variable the same as before, then you will not be able to get back the entire information. No, so we need hmm. two, uh, two things, the derivative and the intercept of the... Yeah, the, that is why the intercept is what has to be given as a function of the derivative. Yeah, so now in this case, that the Lagrangian that you wrote hmm. now, what is the analogy of this? Well, exactly the same thing. It's really the same thing except it's in multiple dimensions. So the, intercept the intercept would be, again, basically the x dots are, you want to get rid of, the x, what are the x dots? x dots are your original coordinates. In the con in conversion space, q are coordinates, so are q dots. You want to get rid of q dots, bring in the derivative with respect to the q dots. That is, you want to bring in the p's, del l del q dots. So the, so in a multi, say in, if this had been a single variable, single degree of freedom system, you could plot L as a function of x dot, as a curve, and then you will get exactly the intercept. If this had been, say, two degrees of freedom system, two Q dots, then basically it will be, a two, will be two Q dots and a L, so a three-dimensional picture of a surface, and there, instead of a tangent line, you would get a tangent plane. And the intercept would basically be the intercept of the plane with the axis. So basically, it's the same thing again. So you're saying the physical meaning of the intercept. Physical meaning is just that. The physical meaning is fine. Physical meaning, look, first of all, when you say physical meaning, what we usually mean is can we use this in physics? The answer is, of course, we can. As long as we retain complete information, whatever information Lagrangian had for me, Hamiltonian will have the same amount of information. So that is the physical meaning, right? If you want a geometrical meaning, the geometrical meaning will be diff more difficult to draw on a picture simply because you have higher dimensional pictures to draw. But basically, it will be a tangent plane to a surface. And in order to fix a tangent plane, just the slope, there will not be one slope, there will be multiple slopes, and the slopes alone won't be enough. You'll also have to give me intercepts with all the axes, which is basically the same way of talking about a mul mul higher dimensional line like thing. So the picture is exactly the same, except that you cannot really draw the picture nicely the moment you have more dimensions. With one dimension, in fact, you would try it out with, say, L equal to half, um, K, half uh, x dot square minus half x square. The x square is just a constant. It's, it's just a parameter which is coming in for the right. It's the x dot square which is important. Exactly the same thing that we did here. And usually, because you want the Hamiltonian and not the, which want to look it, make it look like the energy, you usually don't say L minus PQ dot. You say PQ dot minus L. That's just an extra minus sign to get the energy out of it. At least in the, quadra in the case of T minus V, we'll get T plus V and not minus T minus V. Right? Okay. If no more, no more questions, I will say.